A point of interest about Genshin's characters is that, well, there aren't that many of them. For a title that's been out for over three and a half years at this point, for there to be only 80 playable characters, that's unexpectedly low for a gacha game. Most of your garden variety gachas with that kind of time span would have well over three figures to choose from, with a multitude of units released per version. It's understandable though, as unlike its peers, Genshin heavily invests in each of its units, from their involvement in the story, to their place in the world of Tevat, to the extensive amount of voiceover and animations required. It's a far more taxing logistical effort to say the least. While some carry more narrative significance than others, you can't help but appreciate that side of Genshin. The character production has always been top-notch, matching other AAA development projects in caliber and quality. Gameplay-wise, however, is where the disparity in execution is more pronounced. While it's inevitable for some units to outperform others in taking everything into account, every so often we'd run into a character who, whether or not it was intentional, has a moveset that makes little, if any, practical sense to even the most novice of players. For today, we'll be going over the history of Genshin Impact's failed characters, detailing what went wrong with them, the possible reasons why they ended up in such a state, and what can potentially be done to repair them in the future, however copium-induced those solutions may be. The term failed may come off a bit extreme for some of you who are curious as to where my thought process for calling them such comes from, so let's start from there. Obviously, there's no such thing as an objective failure of a character. With enough effort and investment, every single member of the roster is capable of being used, and under no circumstances am I trying to undermine those who have done so. That being said, with any game featuring a roster of playable characters, opportunity cost becomes involved, wherein by selecting one character, you forfeit the properties and whatever advantages they entail of everyone else. For instance, by opting to construct a team comprising Ayaka it means you don't get to play Risley, or by choosing to play Hutao, you don't get to play Linny. In light of this, it's a natural tendency for most gamers to select the option that offers either the most enjoyment for them or the most efficient results, ideally both. Pragmatically speaking, efficiency plays a key influence in unit selection, and is often the vehicle by which video games develop their respective metas. Genshin's no different. Though the player base remains divided on the significance of metas to this day, it doesn't stop a relevant portion of the community from basing their gameplay decisions around that concept. The whole point of my Why No One and Why Everyone Play series is to highlight the aspects of a character that either drives people away from them or draws people towards them, many of which entail something along the lines of them being strong, easy to play, versatile, and lovable if not sexually fantasized over. By that thought process, a character viewed as a failure quote-unquote is one who does not adequately meet those expectations. In other words, yes, I consider a unit a failure if they are too weak to offer anything of noteworthy value. But, having underwhelming practical strength isn't the be-all end-all. Tons of units exist in Genshin with thoughtful designs and engaging gameplay, however insufficient it may be relative to others. More than the character's moveset being efficient, it also has to make sense, and sadly, a non-negligible number of units have parts of their kit that raise more questions than answers. The highest profile example of this in recent time would unarguably have to be Dia, a character so hotly anticipated by virtue of her breaking the mold of most Genshin units back then. She was the first Pyro unit to be released since Oemiya, marking almost a year and a half that the Pyro roster received any new additions. Not only that, but her no-nonsense, fiery personality made her a consummate fan favorite throughout the Sumeru story arc, raising player expectations on how she would perform. When data was made available on her, she was marketed to us as a member of the Berserk archetype, one who routinely sustained heavy damage in exchange for dishing out tenfold in return. Her central experience no doubt resonated with many players, myself included. Having made liberal use of Diluc back in the early days, it felt almost like Dia would be the second coming of the old reliable Pyro Greatsword user, and when they showed us her insane elemental burst animation, it was quite the spectacle. As soon as players got their hands on the flame main though, something was very, very wrong. Her abilities all made sense on paper, but in practice, it felt as if two halves of her kit were designed by entirely separate teams. Her elemental skill instantiated a field that dealt pyro damage to enemies based on Dia's max health and attack whenever damage was inflicted on enemies. Meanwhile, the active character would gain stagger resistance while inside the field. The main point of Molten Inferno was the ability for Dia to basically play the role of a cover tank, redirecting a portion of all damage the active character would sustain to herself and storing it as red means blood. Anyone with a modicum of video game experience would rightfully assume that stored damage has to be used for something beneficial, right? Why else would they make such a big deal out of it, even going so far as to give that stored damage its own term? Little do we know that nothing would actually happen with this resource. All it did was serve to place a hard cap on how much damage Dia could redirect per cast of her skill, with there being no way to use it to one's benefit, despite her playstyle very closely resembling a Berserker-type character. The other issue was her elemental burst, temporarily discarding her claymore to unironically beat the living sh** out of her opponents with their bare fists. A brutal sequence of punches in what may very well be one of the most satisfying animations I've ever laid eyes on. If only it was actually good. Dia's individual punches do not count as normal attacks, preventing her from capitalizing on follow-up support from units like Shinto and Yelan who would have been excellent candidates to back her up in a fight seeing as she's pyro and all. 
What's more is that it felt like a completely missed opportunity for her to not do something with the aforementioned Red Mane's blood, such as having Leonine Bite's attacks get stronger the more damage the stored prior, causing her otherwise beautifully animated ultimate to be one of the most disappointing ones in the game. Coupled with her offensively underwhelming split scaling and the amount of loose ends and questionable design choices for her kit made her an extremely fringe, borderline unusable character with almost no viable reason to be fielded over any of the existing frontrunners in Pyro's cast. To this day, she serves as the capstone example of one of if not the biggest character flops in Genshin Impact history. She had such immense potential to be an incredibly powerful and enjoyable addition to the Pyro roster, all of which came dead on arrival for seemingly no apparent reason. Another noteworthy and recent case of this would have to be Fremenet, although his situation differs from Tia in a number of ways. Unlike the flame main, Fremenet's kit has been touted for being well put together from an experiential standpoint as he feels quite intuitive to play. His failure is as a result of the niche Hoyo endeavor to put him in. Fremenet is a cryo element main DPS greatsword user whose damage mostly comes in the form of physical. Sound familiar? Because that's exactly what Eula is, only Fremenet is a 4 star and 4 star on fielders have historically been dealt a losing hand when compared in power budget to 5 star on fielders. In his defense, unlike the reconnaissance captain, Fremenet is more partial to consistent output over one shot nukes. The gist of his gameplay has him open with his elemental skill to empower his basic attacks to deal cryo damage, after which he can then recast the skill to end on a finishing blow of cryo and or physical damage depending on how many attacks were made, with this ultimate increasing his attack tempo and damage. This effectively enables him to continuously attack, giving him a rather unique playstyle. Where everything backfires on him is that the appeal and necessity of this kind of gameplay expired long before his time. The physical element has been perennially neglected, with there being almost no support for it on a system-wide level compared to the extensive amounts of augmentations afforded to the seven elements. The Elder Stateswoman of the physical archetype is already barely hanging on by taking advantage of coincidental synergistic components like Riding Shogun's Elemental Burst Enhancing Skill or Farina's Party-wide Damage Amp, neither of which offer her greater benefits than if they were provided to anyone else. Fremenet's circumstances contrast with Dia's in that while the latter's maiden voyage was marred not by unideal conditions and the current landscape, rather her own internal design defects, Fremenet's maiden voyage was marred not by his internal design, rather the fact that he was entering a niche long considered dead by most players with virtually zero chance of him reviving it due to sharing the same role as a Yunin who came out two years earlier. The final example is our very own Hydro Traveler, though the list is not limited to those three. While most people consider Dia to be the most public failure in Genshin history, many have labeled Hydro Traveler as the single worst unit in the game. As you're well aware, the Traveler is meant to introduce you to the central mechanic of each element, typically as a reference to the element's respective Archon or Sovereign. In the case of Hydro, among other things such as HP scaling and healing, it's all about manipulating health as a resource. Hydro Traveler certainly checks off on those things, but the way they do is, bluntly speaking, terrible. The elemental skill is the infamous pew pew pew, continuously shooting bubbles of water in a direction before ending with the finishing blow. Persistent hydro application is not an unfamiliar sight for the element, but usually that comes in the form of off-field pressure such as Kokomi, Shinto, Farina, and Yelan. On-fielders would have to contribute far more application or far more damage for them to be worth using, and despite being a 5-star unit by technicality, travelers often equated to a 4-star if not a 3-star unit, even though those don't exist. People crazy enough to use them usually opt to have them as a quick swap sub DPS, using their elemental burst, but what has a lot of people frustrated with the character is that even though they have aspects of Hydro within their moveset, HP manipulation, HP scaling, continuous application and such, none of them really harmonize with each other, or work towards any specific cause. In essence, Hydro Traveler comes off as an extremely downgraded novelette, a character who's only been successful due to having ridiculously overtuned scaling and base damage, along with actual internal synergy between his charge attack skill and burst. Up until Fontaine, the Genshin community developed an impression that subsequent versions of the Traveler will grow more and more practically usable, as evident by Electro Traveler finding sparse representation during the early days of Inazuma, and Dendro Traveler being a surprisingly decent option among the first three Dendro units made available. Mind you, once Nahida and I'll Hate Them joined the fray, all semblance of use cases for DMC evaporated almost immediately, but there was a sense of growth and improvement from each version to the next. Hydro Traveler took all of that progress and destroyed it, being debatably worse than even Animo and Geo Traveler relative to the options available. It has nothing to do with the Hydro roster being overly stacked either. Hydro Traveler has no niche, has no direction, and has no advantage. They could have done just about anything else except this, and they would have been so much better. Failed units are not failures, solely because they're weak. That plays a major part, yes, but there are units of veritable reasons to be used, even if they don't achieve the status of meta. I consider them failures for their design or the target niche they had in mind. Beyond the aforementioned three, Candice, Shinyan, Chichi, Kave, Amber, Aloy, for each of these units, there's a major defect in their kit that breaks any hopes of them finding their place in the meta, or there's no rhyme or reason for them to pursue the niche they were intended for. 
I can give a pass to Chi-Chi and Amber seeing as they were day one units, but for everyone else, they should have known better. One could argue that not every unit needs to go after a mainstream role as that would dilute the unit pool with too many characters feeling too similar to each other. If every Hydro unit was a copy of Xingchou or every Pyro unit was trying to emulate Shanling, Genshin wouldn't have the wide range of nuances between units that people have come to love about the game. I'm sure there are numerous mains of units I brought up in this video who chose to play them because there's something within their experiences that resonate with the player. What bothers me is that there could have been a world where those characters had even more satisfying gameplay or at least a practical incentive however small it may be. I agree that not everyone should be meta, that would just lead to power creep which can alienate players, but there's a difference between not making a character overpowered and constructing a moveset that makes sense for a purpose that is being supported. Fremenet would not have been a failed unit if he came out in version 1 when physical damage was on par with elemental damage. His kit would have been very enjoyable to play and make him an alternative choice for those who didn't have or didn't want to play Razor. It's only because he came out in version 4, at which point physical has been long neglected, that it hurt his reception. Tia being able to store damage taken and using it to increase her own attack and the ability for her burst to trigger follow-ups would not have made her overpowered. Those two improvements alone would have made her so much more satisfying to play and use while still being the exact same character. It's commonly agreed upon that if Chi Chi had energy regeneration, that alone would greatly elevate her usability. Characters need to have a purpose, and they need to have a place. If they're missing either, then they won't be successful. It's about fairness. The same attention and care being put into every unit's moveset just like they do with their animations, backstory, etc. It's unfair to see some units have very thoughtful and cohesive designs while others were programmed by an intern. I really hate to bring up Star L because I understand designing an overall action RPG character is more complex than a turn-based one, but apart from the version 1.0 units, every unit that came out from 1.1 after was designed to have a purpose and a place in the meta, even the not-so-popular ones like Yu Kong. Genshin could do the same, very easily. The number of well-made units is greater than the number of failures, so it's not like they don't know what they're doing. They know exactly what is necessary to conceptualize a unit with a functioning and practical kit, which makes it all the more aggravating that units like these exist. The obvious answer to remedying the situation would be for Hoyo to actually release balance changes to the game and add these mechanics. Unfortunately, that's a highly unlikely outcome. They made one exception for Zhongli from the sheer amount of outrage he generated online. The reason they won't ever do it again though is that it sets a precedent. We all know they'll never nerf a character because if they do, anyone who invested in that unit will feel disillusioned and quit the game. Buffing a character isn't a wise choice either though, as preferential treatment seldom if ever is well received. If they buff Dia and Chi Chi, players will ask them to buff other characters, and you know how fervent Genshin players are for their mates. Sadly for a number of these units, there really isn't another way to make them better outside of buffing. For those like Femine, who are bogged down by poor circumstance, the moment Physical receives actual newfound attention and support is the moment he'll get back into the game. But for Dia, realistically I can't think of anything. We already thought Linny and the Nivellet and Neverina would buff her, but not really. Singles to Hydro Traveler, the problem lies within the abilities themselves. Increasing scaling, adding better synergy, maybe some adjustments to internal cooldowns or regular cooldowns for that matter. I get that Hoyo is staunchly against power creeping for Genshin given it's supposed to be the casual, relaxing title for people to enjoy at their own pace. But like I said before, they don't have to super buff a character to make them feel good to play and use, they just have to make the character work. Some of these units are just straight up broken, not overpowered broken, broken broken. At the bare minimum, every unit should have a purpose in the meta. Units like Hazel, Charlotte, Lynette, and Cole are obviously not breaking any records, but they can be used if in the event players do not have better options. Units like Hydro Traveler, Shinya, and Dia, I'd be hard pressed to recommend even investing in them unless you have a personal preference for the character. Of course, some just one man's opinion, we can obviously agree to disagree on what is considered a failure or not. I just wish they were more consistent with their character designs. Not everyone has to be great, but at least make them good. Anyways, if you enjoyed the video, it would be great if you could leave a like and subscribe. Consider following my Twitter at Varsverm, joining my Discord server, and checking out my other discussion videos if you haven't yet. But till next time, thanks so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.